Darwin's Doubt, Part 8. Uh, for those who are coming on this uh, at first, Darwin's Doubt is a book written by Stephen Meyer, who is author of Signature in the Cell. He used to be an oil industry geophysicist before he became involved in the intelligent design movement. Then uh, got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science and uh, became the director for the Center of S for Science and Culture of the Discovery Institute. The book is a massive expansion of Meyer's article and edition, as we saw last week, of, of the article, The Origin of Biologic Information in the Higher Taxonomic Categories in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. That's Washington, D.C., not Washington State. Uh, the article that got retracted and uh, then got the editor hounded out of his job. Uh, book looks like that. The prologue notes that the book is divided into three main parts, and we're going to complete the second part today. Part one is the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. Part three, after Darwin, what? That's what we'll talk about next week. The story so far in part one, Steve Meyer outlined that the sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin, and the problem has only gotten worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Qingjiang fossils. The excuse that precursors were soft body and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. And um, Steve Meyer gives a massive amount of evidence. Uh, claims that intermediates are really there, are lacking evidence, and not believed by the experts in the field. Genetics seem to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed, so they really need to be there by uh, Darwinian theory. The tree of life itself is not as secure as one would like and therefore can't be used uh, effectively as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion. And punctuated equilibrium, uh, while helpful around the margins, does not explain the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion itself. We then switched into part two and asked the reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinian, Dar Darwinism is because the Darwinism has to explain the massive, the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, but functional information. There's always been a doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the recent work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made the job much more daunting. Steve Meyer then wrote a paper that called attention to this work, only to see the paper put on what could be called an index. It's not part of the peer-reviewed literature, even though it passed peer review. And Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. Sternberg now works for the Discovery Center, um, the Discovery Institute. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, and Meyer takes that article apart, showing that the article's main claimed uh, peer-reviewed support doesn't really say what the article says it says, and uh, doesn't support the idea that uh, the Cambrian explosion has been solved. <clears throat> Last week we talked about new developments in population genetics, which um, uh, have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes in DNA that are advantageous. True in bacteria as well, but especially in multicellular animals. And uh, we're finishing part two, how to build an animal. The origin of body plans. Starting in the autumn of 1979 at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, two venturesome young geneticists, Christiane Nusslein Volhard and Eric Weishaus, um, generated thousands of mutations to investigate the genomes of tens of thousands of fruit flies. 
They hope to get them to divulge the secrets of embryological development. In technical jargon, Nislein Volhard and Weishaus perform saturation mutagenesis experiments, basically as many mutations as the organisms could handle, and more than some could handle. After feeding male fruit flies the potent mutation causing chemical ethyl methane sulfonate, Nestle and Volhard and Weishaus bred the males with virgin females and then examined the offspring larvae for visible defects. In generating many thousands of mutants, thereby saturating the Drosophila genome, Nestle and Volhard and Weishaus induced variations in the small subset of genes that specifically regulate embryonic development. These regulatory genes normally control the expression of many other genes that build the fly embryo, progressively subdividing it into regions that will become the head, thorax, and abdomen of the adult fly. The EMS mutation disrupts DNA replication, thereby the ethylmethylene sulfonate mutagen disrupts DNA replication, thereby mutating genes. These mutations affect the process of development, leaving visible defects in the fly larvae. By observing the damaged larvae, Weishaus and uh, Nestlein Volhard inferred how specific genes regulate the development of different parts of the fly body plan. The thoroughness and novelty of the Heidelberg screens, as the experiment came to be known, and their importance for revealing the mechanism of regulatory control during embry animal embryogenesis won the attention of the Nobel Committee in 1995. The committee awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology to Nestlein, Volhard, and Weishaus. This work was revolutionary, University of Cambridge. I'm sorry, that should be Weishaus. That's bad pronunciation. <coughs> Uh, this work was revolutionary, University of uh, Cambridge Genesis Daniel St. Johnson explained, because it was the first mutagenesis in any multicellular organism that attempted to find most or all of the mutations that affect the essential patterning genes that are used throughout development. That's the story as it's usually told, and it's correct as far as it goes. But the mutant fruit flies obtained by Nusslein uh, Volhard and Vichaus tell another story, one less widely known, but one containing important clues for the unsolved mystery of the origin of animal body plans. Vichaus himself alluded to these clues in a memorable interaction at the 1982 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. After a session on the processes of macroevolution in which Vichaus had presented a paper, one audience member asked him what he meant by the term strong, as in strong mutations. As he used it to describe the mutations he and Nusslein Volhard had introduced in flies. Vichas explained with a laugh that strong certainly did not mean alive. Without exception, the mutants he studied perished as deformed larvae long before repro achieving reproductive age. No, dead is dead, he joked, and you can't be more dead. Another questioner then asked Vichaus about the implications of his findings for evolutionary theory. Here, Vichaus responded more soberly, wondering aloud about whether his collection of mutants offered any insights into how evolutionary process could have constructed novel body plans. The problem is, we think we've hit all the genes required to specify the body plan of Drosophila, he said, and yet these results are obviously not promising as raw materials for macroevolution. The next question then, I guess, is what are or what would be the right mutations for major evolutionary change? And we don't know the answer to that. Again, this is the Reader's Digest version, so we won't be... Um, uh, according, to, according to the last statement, there's some relevance about those things. 
the way the, the, the origins are in fact true by the way that they have representation. So there's evidence in it, and the evidence is congruent to what the history is. Well, well what they're suggesting, I think, is that if you're going to get a new body plan, you're going to have to mutate several things in very specific ways, uh, some ways even perhaps that add information, um, that just randomly changing the genome uh, really doesn't help significantly. And that's, that's one of the problems we have with trying to explain this by, by use of undirected evolution is that uh, how do you hit a target that small by luck alone? Even if your mutation and selection could generate fundamentally new genes and proteins, a more formidable problem remains. To build a new animal and establish its body plan, proteins need to be organized into higher level structures. The role of genes and proteins in animal development. We're going to go over that now. During development, the appropriate genes must be turned on or upregulated and turned off or downregulated to ensure the production of the correct protein products at the right time and in the right cell types. There's not just a matter of whether the protein is there in the genome, but you have to tell it when to produce it and where. Painstaking genetic research, performed by Nestling Volhard and Vichaus and many other developmental biologists, has uncovered many of the key embryonic regulatory disease, uh, genes that help switch cells into their differentiated adult types. This research has also uncovered a profound difficulty cutting to the very core of the neo-Darwinian view of life. Early acting body plans, mutations, and embryonic lethals. To create significant changes in the form of animals, in the forms of animals, requires attention to timing. Mutations in genes expressed late in development of an animal will affect relatively few cells and architectural features. Late acting mutations, therefore, cannot cause any significant or heritable change in the form or body plan of the whole animal. You could change the color of the coat, but you can't change the, let's say, the length of the neck. Um, uh, various other uh, things that, that make a difference between, let's say, one class and another class, or perhaps more importantly for the Cambrian, one whole, uh, in one case, trilobites, which you know are kind of squat, divided into three lobes, and and um, with a lot of appendages or or, or hallucinogenia, which is skinny and and has appendages going both ways and, and does not have the shell on the outside. How do you get between those two is the question. If you, if you mutate uh, genes that are expressed late, you, you can't change the fundamental body plan. Late-acting mutations, therefore, cannot cause any significant or heritable changes in the form or body plan of the animal. As evolutionary geneticists Bernard John and George Miklos explain, macroevolutionary change requires changes in very early embryogenesis. Former Yale University evolutionary biologist Keith Thompson concurs, only mutations expressed early in the development of organisms can produce large-scale macroevolutionary changes. Yet, from the first experiments by geneticist T.H. Morgan systematically mutating fruit flies early in the 20th century until today, developmental biology has shown that mutations affecting body plan formation expressed early in development inevitably damages the organism. As one of the founders of neo-Darwinist, uh, Darwinism, excuse me, geneticist R.A. Fisher noted, such mutations are either definitely pathological, most often lethal, in their effects, or they result in an organism that cannot survive in the wild state, which is to say they're pathological in the environment. 
Normal development in any animal can be represented as an expanding network of decisions where the earliest upstream decisions have greater impact than those occurring later. Geneticist Bruce Wallace explains why early acting mutations are thus overwhelmingly likely to disrupt animal development. The extreme difficulty encountered, he observes, when attempting to transform one organism into another, still functional, one lies in the difficulty, I think I have somehow not gotten that completely cut properly. No, I think that's his, uh, that's his, uh, the extreme difficulty encountered when attempting to transform one animal into another, still functional one, lies in the difficulty in resetting a number of the many controlling switches in a manner that still allows for the individual's orderly somatic development. Nuslein Volhard and Vishaus discovered this problem in um, experiments performed on fruit flies after their first Nobel Prize winning efforts. In these later experiments, they studied protein molecules that influenced the organization of different types of cells early in the process of embryological development. Okay. Um, <clears throat> These molecules, called morphogens, include one called bicoid. Including one called bicoid are critical to its f establishing the fr fruit fly's head to tail axis. They found that when these early acting body plan affecting molecules are perturbed, development shuts down. When mutations occur in the gene that codes for bicoid, the resulting embryos die. As they do in all other known cases in which mutations occur early, in the regulatory genes that affect body plan formation. Bicoid is something that tells you which end is the head and which end is the tail. Looking more closely at specific experimental research of this kind, results of this kind, further illuminates the problem. Mutations in the regulatory ultrabithorax gene, which is expressed midway in the development of a fly, produces an extra pair of wings on a normally two-winged creature. Although an extra set of wings may sound like a useful piece of equipment, it's not at all. This innovation results in a crippled insect that cannot fly because it lacks, among other things, a, musculator, a musculature to support the use of its new wings. So they have a four-ring fruit fly. Well, there are lots of four-winged uh, uh, insects, for example, dragonflies. But the dragonflies have muscles on their back wings. These things, because they grow back wings but no uh, muscles on them. Um, uh, the, the back wings just sit there. And the front wings do all the work, and the back wings actually get in the way. And the interesting thing of it is, the back wings are grown instead of some structures called halters, which normally move around along with the wings and, uh, and help the fly to maintain balance. There's some fru uh, fruit flies with different kinds of wings that um, are mutated. The short wings that are too small to fly, the curly wings, which are too weird to fly, the eyeless, which can fly but can't see, and the antennapedia, which has antennae in front uh, where its legs should be, but also doesn't reproduce. This problem has led to what Georgia Tech geneticist John F. McDonald has called a great Darwinian paradox. He notes that the genes are obviously variables within natural populations that are obviously variable within natural populations seem to affect only minor aspects of form and function. While those genes that uh, govern major changes, the very stuff of macroevolution, apparently do not vary or vary only to the detriment of the organism. As he puts it, those genetic loci, loci that are obviously variable within natural populations do not seem to lie at the basis of many major adaptive, change, adaptive changes. Well, those loci that are seemingly do constitute the foundation of many, if not most, major adaptive changes are not variable within natural populations. 
You can change the little stuff. You can't change the big stuff. Which means, uh, if you want to put it bluntly, there's a big difference between microevolution and macroevolution, in spite of people who scream loudly that there's no difference. My Discovery Institute colleague, Paul Nelson, a philosopher of biology who specializes in evolutionary theory and developmental biology, summarizes the challenge to neo-Darwinism neo posed by animal development as three premises. Number one, animal body plans are built in each generation by a stepwise process, from the fertilized egg to the many cells of the adult. The earliest stages in this process determine what follows. Thus, to evolve any body plan, mutations expressed early in the development must occur, must be viable, and must be stably transmitted to offspring. If they don't occur, they can't be transmitted. If they're not viable, they can't be transmitted. And they have to be stably transmitted, otherwise they're not transmitted either. However, three such early acting mutations of global effect on animal development uh, are the least likely to be tolerated by the embryo. And in fact, never have been tolerated in any animals that developmental biologists have studied. Now, that doesn't prove it couldn't possibly happen, but if it's never happened, it, certainly the assumption would be that it's not likely to happen in the future. Nelson came to appreciate the depth of the problem posed by these facts after many years of discussion with two members of his University of Chicago PhD committee. Evolutionary biologist Levin Valen, who's now dead, and evolutionary theorist and philosopher of biology William Wimsatt. Van Valen, famous for his Red Queen hypothesis about the need for organisms to continue to evolve in order to maintain fitness, was, a passionately, was passionately interested in the mechanisms of microevolution. Wimsatt originated the theory of gen generative entrenchment, an account of the causal asymmetries at work in complex systems, including those responsible for animal development. Things get in a rut, I guess, is kind of a short version of that. Both acknowledged to Nelson that the scientific literature offers no examples of viable mutations affecting early animal development and body plan formation. And also that the macroevolution of novel animal forms requires just such early acting mutations. They don't happen, but they need to happen. And they need to happen in the Cambrian to be specific. Nevertheless, both Van Valen and Wimsatt remain committed to the descent of animal forms from a common ancestor via some kind of undirected mutations. Nelson, as he's told me, if the only kind of mutations that can conceivably produce enough morphological change to alter whole body plans never causes beneficial and heritable changes, then it is difficult to see how mutation and selection could ever produce new body plans in the first place. Microevolutionary change is insufficient. Macro mutations, large scale changes, are harmful. So, how do you get from point A to point B if you can't take little steps and you can't, little steps aren't good enough and the big steps always result in disaster? This paradox has beset Darwinism from its inception, but discoveries about the genetic regulation of development in animals have made this paradox more acute and cast serious doubt on the efficacy of the modern neo-Darwinian mechanism as an explanation for the new body plans that arise in the Cambrian period. Developmental gene regulatory networks. This is multiple genes that work together. Another line of research in developmental biology has revealed a related challenge to the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Developmental biologists have discovered that many gene products, proteins and RNAs, needed for the development of specific animal body parts plans, transmit signals that influence the way individual cells develop and differentiate themselves. I have an extra word that should be omitted. These signaling molecules influence each other 
to form circuits or networks of coordinated interaction, much like the integrated circuits on a circuit board. Consequently, just as mutating an individual regulatory gene early in the development of an animal will inevitably shut down the development, so too will mutations or alterations in the whole network of interacting signaling molecules destroy a developing embryo. The cells of an individual animal, no matter how varied in form and function, generally contain identical genomes. So some control system must determine which genes are expressed in different cells at different times to ensure the differentiation of different cell types from each other. Some system-wide regulatory logic must oversee and coordinate the ex expression of the genome. Think about it. In a fly, or a trilobite for that matter, you will have muscle cells, you will have nerve cells, you will have um, digestive cells, all of which are producing different kinds of proteins, secreting them in different ways, or perhaps using them inside the, the cell in different ways, all from the same set of instructions. So you have to have something to say to the muscle cell, don't make nerve cell proteins, and don't make digestive proteins. But in, to say to the digestive protein, uh, digestive cell, make digestive proteins and secrete them on one side of you. So there's got to be some kind of control that tells them when to use which stretches of DNA. On arriving at Caltech in 1971, Davidson chose the purple sea urchin, Strangulocentrotus purpuratus as his experimental model system. And that should be italicized, and that's my mistake. This process does not happen fortuitously in the sea urchin, but uh, the process of development, but is via a highly regulated and precise control system, as it does in all animals. Indeed, one of the simplest animals, the worm uh, C. elegans, and that again should be italicized, um, possessing just over a thousand cells as an adult is constructed during development by developmental gene regulatory networks of remarkable precision and complexity. In all animals, the various DGRNs direct what Davidson describes as the embryo's progressive increase in complexity, an increase, he writes, that can be measured in informational terms. Remember, they all start with an egg, fertilized egg, and then divide it up into various other cells, add material as necessary, and so forth. Davidson notes that once established, the complexity of the DRGRNs as integrated circuits make them stubbornly resistant to mutational change, a point he has stressed in nearly every publication on the topic over the past 15 years. In the sea urchin embryo, he points out, disarming any one of these subcircuits produces some abnormality in expression. Indeed, there are no examples of these deeply entrenched, functionally critical circuits varying at all. At the periphery of the hierarchy are gene regulatory networks that specify the arrangement for smaller scale features that some can sometimes vary. Yet to produce a new body plan requires altering the axis and global form of the animal. This requires mutating the very circuits that do not vary without catastrophic results. As Davidson emphasizes, mutations affecting the DGRNs that regulate body plan development lead to catastrophic loss of the body plan or loss of viability altogether. He explains in more detail, there's always an observable consequence if a DGRN circuit is interrupted. Since these consequences are always catastrophically bad, Flexibility is minimal, and since the subcircuits are all interconnected, the whole network partakes of the quality that there is only one way for things to work. And indeed, the embryos of each species develop in only one way. Davidson's work highlights a profound contradiction between neo-Darwinian accounts, the neo-Darwinian account of how new, body, new animal body plans are built, and one of the most basic 
principles of engineering, the principle of constraints. Engineers have long understood that the more functionally integrated a system is, the more difficult it is to change any part of it without damaging or destroying the system as a whole. Davidson's work confirms that this principle applies to developing or organisms in spades. But given this, how could a new bo animal body plan and the new GGRNs necessary to produce it ever evolve gradually via mutation and selection from a pre-existing body plan and set of DGRNs? Neo-Darwinian evolution assumes that all processes work the same way so that evolution of enzymes or flower colors can be used as current proxies for the study of evolution of the body plan. It erroneously assumes that changes in protein coding sequence is the basic cause of change in developmental program. And it erroneously assumes that evolutionary changes in body plan morphology occurs by a continuous process. You can go gradually from a starfish to a trilobite. With each intermediate being viable. All these assumptions are basically counterfactual. That is to say, they're wrong. This cannot be surprising since the neo-Darwinian synthesis from which these idea stem was a pre-molecular biology concoction focused on population genetics and natural history, neither of which have any direct mechanistic support for the genomic regulatory systems that derive embryonic development of the body plan. In other words, these are simply uh, just so stories that came about before we really understood how these things worked. We probably still don't understand all about how they work, but we know enough to know that those just so stories are, in fact, not valid ones. Darwin's doubt about the Cambrian explosion centered on the problem of missing fossil intermediates. Not only have those forms not been found, but the Cambrian explosion itself illustrates a profound engineering problem that fossil evidence does not address. The problem of building a new form of animal life by gradually transforming one tightly integrated system of genetic components and their products into another. Yet in the next chapter we will see that an even more formidable problem remains and now we will go to the epigenetic revolution. In 1924 two German scientists Hans Spurman and Hilda Mangold reported an intriguing experiment the significance of which could not been, have been fully appreciated at the time. Three decades before the discovery of the information bearing properties of DNA. Using microsurgery, Sperman and Mangold excised a portion of a newt embryo and transplanted that portion into another developing newt embryo. They achieved a startling result. The second embryo produced two bodies each with a head and tail joined together at the belly, not unlike Siamese twins. Yet despite dramatically altering the anatomy of the embryo, Sperman and Mangold did not alter its DNA. All they did was just put a piece of an embryo with another one. Their experiment later suggested a radical possibility that something in addition to DNA profoundly influences the development of animal body plans. Other experiments suggested as much. In the 1930s and 1940s, American biologist Ethel Harvey showed experimentally that sea urchin embryos could undergo development up to about 500 cells after the removal of their nuclei. In other words, without their nuclear DNA. That they just kept developing and then about 500 cells they ran out of uh, whatever it was that allowed them to keep developing, all with no DNA whatsoever. In the 1960s, Belgian scientists chemically blocked the transcription of DNA into RNA in amphibian embryos and found that the embryos could still develop to the point of containing several thousand cells. Again, blocking the use of DNA but still allowing the animals to keep going for several thousand cells. 
In the 1970s, Canadian biologists showed that a frog embryo could undergo early development without its nucleus if the cell division apparatus from a sea urchin was injected into the frog. Apparently, the centriole was necessary, and if you took the nucleus in the centriole, you're, you're hung. But as long as you had the centriole, it could keep on developing for a while. How do they do that without DNA? None of these results indicate that embryos can develop fully without DNA. In every case, DNA was eventually necessary to complete embryological development. Yet these results suggested that DNA is not the whole story. That other sources of information are playing important roles in developing at least the early stages of animal development. In 2003, MIT Press published a groundbreaking collection of scientific essays titled Origination of Organismal Form, Beyond the Gene in Development, uh, Developmental and Evolutionary Biology, edited by two distinguished developmental and evolutionary biologists, Gerd Miller of the University of Vienna and Stuart Newman of New York Medical College. As Mueller and uh, Newman explained in their introduction, detailed information at the level of the gene does not serve to explain form. You need more. Instead, as Newman explains, epigenetic or contextual information plays a crucial role in the formation of animal body assemblies during embryological development. Mueller and Newman concluded that recent discoveries about the role of epigenetic information in animal development pose a fund formidable challenge to the standard neo-Darwinian account of the origin of these body plans, perhaps the most formidable of all, although since we don't know as much about it right now, it isn't necessarily the most formidable that we uh, can see. In the introductory essay to their volume, Mueller and Newman list a number of open questions in evolutionary biology, including the question of the origin of Cambrian era animal body plans and the origin of organismal form generally, the latter being the central topic of their book. They note that th the neo-Darwinian paradigm still represents, uh, you know, still represents the central explanatory fra framework of evolution, that although it does, it has no theory of the generative. As they and others in their volume maintain, neo-Darwinism lacks an explanation for the origin of organismal form precisely because it cannot explain the origin of epigenetic information. Jonathan Wells, there's a section on him that talks about how he introduced Steve um, Meyer to this uh, subject. To see why the epigenetic information poses an additional challenge to neo-Darwinism and to see exactly what biologists mean by epigenetic information, let's examine the relationship between biological form and biological information. And we're going to try to go th over that. We're going to talk about, of course, DNA has information in it. Um, but similarly, animal body plans represent not only highly improbable, but also highly specific ar arrangements of matter. Organismal form and function depends on the precise arrangement of various constituents as they arise during or contribute to embryological development. Thus, the specific arrangement of the other building blocks of biological form, cells, clusters of similar cell types, the GRNs, tissues and organs, also represents a kind of specified or functional information. Perhaps because the information carrying capacity of the gene can be so easily measured, Biologists have often treated DNA, RNA, and proteins as the sole repositories of biological information. Neo-Darwinists have assumed that mutations in genes will suffice to generate the new information necessary to build a new form of animal life. Yet, if biologists understand organismal form as resulting from constraints on the possible arrangements of matter at many levels in biological hierarchy, from genes to proteins, from to cell types and tissues, to organs and body plans, then biological organisms may well exhibit many levels of information-rich structure. Discoveries in developmental biology have confirmed this possibility. Since the 1980s, developmental and cell biologists such as Brian Goodwin, Wallace Arthur, Stuart Newman, Fred, I guess that's Nyhout, 
uh, and Harold Franklin have discovered or analyzed many sources of epigenetic information. Even molecular bi biologists such as Sidney Brenner, who pioneered the idea that genetic programs develop animal development, now insist that the information needed to code for complex biological systems vastly outstrips the information in DNA. Two analogies may clarify the point. At a construction site, builders will make use of many materials, lumber, wires, nails, drywall, piping, and windows. Yet, building materials do not determine the floor plan of the house or the arrangement of houses in a neighborhood. Similarly, electric, electronic circuits are composed of many components, such as resistors, capacitors, and transistors. But such lower level components do not determine their own arrangement in an integrated circuit. And uh, there's an example of where you have an electrical component, which is itself very complex, that's put onto a circuit board with several other electronic components, which is then put into a computer with several other uh, uh, components integrated into it. And so you have single component assembly instructions, but you also have higher level assembly instructions. Now, some examples of epigenetic information. Cytoskeletal arrays. Eukaryotic cells have internal skeletons to give them shape and stability. All of the Cambrian explosion is eukaryotic cells. These cytoskeletons are made of several different kinds of filaments, including those called microtubules. Just to pay attention to the microtubules themselves, the structure and location of those microtubules in the cytoskeleton influence the patterning and development of the embryos. Things are transported along the microtubules, for example. Microtubule arrays within embryonic cells help to distribute essential proteins used during the development used during development to specific locations in these cells. So the microtubules are, uh, you could think of them as highways if you wanted to, or roads. Another cell structure influences the arrangement of the microtubule arrays and thus the precise structures they form and the functions they perform. In an animal cell, that structure is called the centrosome literally central body. Soma is body in Greek. <coughs> a microscopic organelle that sits next to the nucleus between cell divisions in an undividing cell. Emanating from the centrosome is a microtubule array that gives a cell its three-dimensional shape and provides internal tracks for the directed transport of organelles and essential molecules to and from the nucleus. During cell division, the centrosome duplicates itself. The two centrosomes form the poles of the cell division apparatus, and each daughter cell inherits one of the centrosomes. Yet the centrosome contains no DNA. Though the centrosomes are made of proteins, gene products, the centrosome structure is not determined by genes alone. And for example, if you take out a centrosome, the body will not form another, or the cell will not form another one. It needs one centrosome to be able to divide to make two of them. Membrane patterns, and um, one of the examples is membrane targets. For example, early embryo development in the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster requires the regulatory molecules bicoid, which codes for the head, and nanos, which codes for the tail. In the early stages of embryological development, nurse cells pump bicoid and nanos RNAs into the egg. Nurse cells provide the cell that will become the egg, known as the oocyte, and the embryo with maternally encoded messenger RNA and proteins. In uh, insects and uh, arthropods in general, um, there are actually nurse cells that kind of help the egg cell along by doing some of these kinds of things. Cytoskeletal arrays then transport the RNA through the oocyte where they become attached to specified targets on the inner surface of the egg. 
once in their proper place, but only then by coitonanos play critical roles in organizing the head to tail axis of the developing fruit fly. Ion channels and electromagnetic fields. Although the ion channels that, that generate the fields consist of protein that may be encoded by DNA, just as the microtubules consist of the subunit encoded by DNA, their pattern in the membrane is not encoded by DNA. And then there's what they call the sugar code. Uh, biologists know of an additional source of epigenetic information stored in the arrangement of sugar molecules on the exterior surface of the cell membrane. Sugars can be attached to the lipid molecules that make up the membrane itself, in which case they're called glyp glycolipids, or they can be attached to proteins embedded in the membrane, in which case they're called glycoproteins. Uh, since simple sugars can be combined in many more ways, than amino acids, which make up proteins, the resulting cell surface patterns can be enormously complex. As biologist Ron Schnarr explains, each sugar molecule, each sugar building block can assume several different positions. It is as if, as if an A could, be, could serve as four different letters depending on whether it was standing upright, turned upside down, or laid on either of its sides. In fact, seven simple sugars can be arranged to form hundreds of, the thou of thousands of unique words, most of which have no more than five letters. Neo-Darwinism and the challenge of epi epigenetic information. These different sources of epigenetic information in embryonic cells pose an enormous challenge to the sufficiency of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. According to neo-Darwinism, New information, form, and structure arise from natural selection acting on random mutations arising at a very low level within the biological hierarchy within the genetic text. Yet both body plan formation during embryological development and major morphological innovation during the history of life depend on a specificity of arrangement at a much higher level of the organizing, organizational hierarchy, a level that DNA alone does not determine. If DNA isn't wholly responsible for the way an embryo develops, for body plan morphogenesis, then DNA sequences can mutate indefinitely and still not produce a new body plan. If you need extra information until you get that extra information, you're not going to get a new body plan. Regardless of the amount of time and the number of mutation trials available to the evolutionary process, genetic mutations are simply the wrong tool for the job at hand. Now, this is responses of people who uh, want to put everything onto genes. That's what gene-centric responses means in this case. Many of the biological structures that impart important three-dimensional spatial information, such as cytoskeletal arrays and membrane ion channels, are made of proteins. For this reason, some biologists have insisted that the genetic information in DNA the codes for these proteins does account for the spatial information in these varying structures after all. In each case, however, this exclusively gene-centric view of the location of biological information and the origin of biological form has proven inadequate. Their sugar molecules on the cell surface, he discussed, their location is not determined by the genes that code for the proteins to which these sugar molecules might be attached. Instead, research suggests that protein patterns in the cell membrane are transmitted directly from parent membrane to daughter membrane during cell division, rather than as a result of gene expression in each new generation of cells. And then there are the membrane targets, the sodium-potassium ion pumps, microtubules, and the centrosome. And the centrioles that compose the centrosomes replicate independently of DNA replication. Daughter centrioles receive their form from the overall structure of the mother centriole, not from the individual gene products that constitute them. Exactly how that works is not clear, but that it works is clear. 
Additional evidence of this kind comes from ciliates, large single-celled eukaryotic organisms. Biologists have shown that microsurgery on the cell membrane of ciliates can produce heritable changes in membrane patterns without altering the DNA. This suggests that membrane patterns, as opposed to membrane constituents, are impressed directly on the daughter cells. In both cases, in membrane patterns and centrosomes, form is transmitted from the parent three-dimensional structure to daughter three-dimensional structure directly. It is not entirely contained in DNA sequences or the proteins for which these sequences code. Epigenetic mutations, well, uh, as Steve Meyer says, when I explain in public this in, play, in public talks, I can count on getting the same question. Someone in the audience will ask whether mutations could alter the structures in which epigenetic information resides. The questioner wonders if changes in epigenetic information could supply the variation in innovation that natural selection needs to generate new form. In much the same way that neo-Darwinists envision genetic mutations doing so. In other words, couldn't you have mutations in the epigenetic code just like you have in the, uh, in the genetic code? It's a reasonable thing to ask, but it turns out that mutating epigenetic information doesn't offer a realistic way of generating new forms of life. To the extent that cell structures can be altered, these alterations are overwhelmingly likely to have harmful or catastrophic consequences, just like the uh, mutations of early expressed DNA does. The original sperm and Mangold experiment did, of course, involve forcibly altering an important repository of epigenetic information in a developing embryo. Yet the resulting embryo, though interesting and illustrative of the importance of the epigenetic information, this is our two-headed salamander, or two-bodied salamander, so to speak, uh, did not stand a chance of surviving in the wild, let alone reproducing. It can't crawl on its own. Without that, it's going to starve to death. In chapter 16, I will examine several new theories of evolution, including one known as epigenetic inheritance. We'll see that there are some additional difficulties associated with the idea that mutations in epigenetic structures can produce significant evolutionary innovation. Contemporary critics of neo-Darwinism acknowledge, of course, that pre-existing forms of life can diversify under the twin influences of natural selection and genetic mutation. Known microevolutionary processes can account for small changes in the coloring of peppered moths, the acquisition of antibiotic resistance in different strains of bacteria, and cyclical variations in the size of uh, Galapagos finch beaks. Nevertheless, many biologists now argue that neo-Darwinian theory does not provide an adequate explanation for the origin of new body plans or events, such as the Cambrian explosion. For example, evolutionary biologist Keith Stewart of Thompson, formerly of Yale University, has expressed doubt that large-scale morphological change could accumulate by minor changes at the genetic level. Geneticist George Miklos of the Australian National University has argued that neo-Darwinism fails to provide a mechanism that can produce large-scale innovations in form and structure. Biologists Scott Gilbert, John Opitz, and Rudolf Raff have attempted to develop a new theory of evolution to supplement ca classical neo-Darwinism, which they argue cannot adequately explain large-scale macroevolutionary changes. As they note, Starting in the 1970s, many biologists began questioning its, that is, neo-Darwinism's, adequacy in explaining evolution. Genetics might be adequate for explaining microevolution, but microevolutionary changes in gene, gene frequency were not seen as able to turn a reptile into a mammal or to convert a fish into an amphibian. Microevolution looks at adaptations that concern the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest, as Goodwin 1995, points out, the origin of species, Darwin's problem, remains unsolved. And notice this is a, an evolutionist that's saying this. Gilbert and his colleagues 
have tried to solve the problem of the origin of form by invoking mutations in genes called Hox genes, which regulate the, develop, uh, the expression of other genes involved in animal development, an approach that I will examine in chapter 16, which is our next chapter. Notwithstanding, many leading biologists and Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I misstated it. It's not our next chapter. Notwithstanding, many leading biologists and paleontologists, and here he has a whole list of them, have raised questions about the adequacy of the standard neo-Darwinian mechanism and or the problem of evolutionary novelty in particular. For this reason, the Cambrian explosion now looks less like the minor anomaly that Darwin perceived it to be and more like a profound enigma one that exemplifies a fundamental and as yet unsolved problem, the origination of animal form. Now, that completes that section. Uh, as I read the chapter, my, my own personal take is that changes in the core genes of multiple organisms are almost uniformly fatal. I think he makes that point pretty clear. However, changes in the core genes are necessary to, produce, to get new body plans, which are needed to create the Cambrian explosion. So how do you get from here to there if every time you try, the animal dies? Without somebody specifically looking in there and saying, I need to tweak this and this and this and this and this all at once. In addition, epigenetic information is necessary and it is not clear how Darwinian processes can produce epigenetic information. The arguments from epigenetics is not as strong at present as some of the others, primarily because of our relative ignorance of the subject. It may turn out to be the most powerful argument of them all. We will have to see what happens as we get more information. But that's my take. Now it's your turn. I have some wonders. Um, things like Agent Orange and thalidomide and nuclear radiation seem to affect the next generation. Does it stop there or does it peter out or do, how, how do those things change? We don't fully understand all of it. Uh, for thalidomide in particular, it probably doesn't affect the next generation. That is to say, Focomelia, as far as I know, uh, that is not inherited, which means that that's, a, if you want to put it that way, that's an epigenetic change that has, a, um, well, Let's, I, I think it's fair to say devastating results for the individual in question. You know, somebody who's born with no arms, little bitty feet, stuck to his body. Uh, that's not where I'd want to, wh where I'd want to go. But uh, it apparently does that all by epigenetic mechanisms. It does not uh, involve the DNA proper. Um, so if that person has kids, they're likely to be normal. Uh, so that may answer uh, part of that. There's a lot of stuff that we really don't understand exactly how this works. Uh, here and then there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, are we clear that, you know, there are some proteins formed by RNA combinations and so on that aren't dictated by the DNA. Are we clear that um, this epigenetic uh, realm is not uh, influenced by RNA or even, uh, I might say, uh, a complex arrangement that, which we don't understand yet through RNA? Well. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I, uh, there's a lot of it that we don't really understand. You know, junk DNA got its name because nobody really understood what it was doing. And one assumption was it wasn't doing anything, that it was just leftover from uh, leftover evolutionary garbage that the, 
cell sometimes sorted through and found a new enzyme in, particularly if it had been mutated for a while. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, now we know it's all, most of it, if not all of it, is transcribed. Does that transcription go in particular places to influence where, let's say, uh, the sodium channels are? <coughs> Maybe. And the fact of the matter is we really don't know. Um, the, the one caution of making it, uh, uh, making it too DNA-centric is that you know, if you can take a, an embryo and take the nucleus clear out of it and have it develop for 500 um, uh, cell divisions, then clearly there's a lot of stuff in there that's either encoded elsewhere or on auto autopilot. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of both. And the fact of the matter is we are like a kid looking at a radio and trying to figure out what makes it work. Mm -hmm. And as a... Uh, mm -hmm. As a neurologist who, if I remember right, had just won the Nobel Prize, uh, told us in medical school, we are kind of like the, you look at this and you pull out the a transistor and the thing suddenly goes, hmm, and we're saying, aha, we have found the anti-hum transistor. And that's about where our knowledge is on some of these things. We've done a really nice job of doing DNA coding but, uh, for example, there's a lot of those orphan genes. We have no clue as to what they do or what they used to do or whether they do anything. And, of course, it's tempting to say, well, if we don't know about it, it didn't happen. But that's a, uh, that's a rather prideful way of looking at it, and I think pride goes before a fall in that particular case. Pass the mic up. Do you think, or does anybody else in here think, depending on the definition of life, that men will create life in the laboratory? There's, the reason why I ask this, there's two things going for it. One is that it seems like God isn't holding back any knowledge about the cell from us. Every time we look in it, we seem to find what, you know, information. And the second part is, we are designers. Now, um, you gave the illustration about the radio. Now, I was a kid, I used to tear radios apart, just like you said. But I got into electronics. I can build a radio now. I know exactly how they work. And, um, and that goes on even beyond us. Let's say that there's an angel that may have lived for thousands or a billion years. How far could he get if he was looking into this stuff? <coughs> How much would he be able to do? <coughs> I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, You know, Ellen White makes some comments that kind of suggest that um, um, that we're not going to make life. Well, yeah, that's that's the question uh, too. What is the what's the definition? Day, we, of it? we didn't have the knowledge to be able to do that. Yeah, but, um, but the I definition. think that in our day we still don't have the knowledge to be able to do that because we have no clue as to where all those microtubules need to be hooked up to. Or well, what that's what I was saying are. about the the definition of life. Yeah. Um, how, well, you we know how far do you, you got sentient life, which ugh, that's yeah. way out there, you know, somewhere. But but is there a way that uh, the small definition of life that we can come up with some sort of little tiny model that will actually grow and whatever? Yeah, do the closest we've to. gotten is we have created DNA de novo. Well, with the help of yeast molecules or yeast. Uh, cells, but essentially de novo. 
and been able to put it into a cell of one particular bacterium and change the bacterium into another bacterium and more importantly have the thing divide and, and, and grow. Um, so we at least have the technology to, to, to change DNA. Now, the, but we still, we pl took a whole cell, we plucked out the DNA, we put the new DNA in. That's a whole, that's a whole lot easier than building a new cell from scratch. And we're not there yet. I suppose it may depend on whether, how long God leaves us on this earth, whether we can get that far or not. I don't know. We're not there yet, I don't think. Once again, I'll preface my remarks by saying I agree with everything you've said here about, uh, and that Myra's saying, that you can't account for complexity with any form of Darwinian evolution, including population genetics and neo-Darwinian evolution. And this introduction of epigenetics does introduce a whole level, uh, uh, explanatory level of paradigms that go beyond Darwinism. However, they're still internal to the developing organism, pretty much. Uh, all these epigenetic modalities, the one specific ones you illustrated, and your suggestion at the end that there may be larger and more significant ones that we haven't discovered yet. And, and last week in my remarks, I commented on the possibility that functioning structures can have causal interrelationships among their functions that interact in such a way as to increase differentiation and to increase levels of integrated complexity without changing the underlying structures that produce those functions. In other words, we're here talking not about, function, uh, uh, about causal relationships among their structures, but causal relationships among their effects. And uh, that essentially uh, opens the field up beyond the organism then and argues that if you're dealing with dynamic equilibria, such as a living system, not a closed system that operates according to the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but an open system that is subject to outside forces, then you have almost unlimited possibilities of generating new information, new levels of complexity and functioning without any fundamental change in the underlying structures at all, or only very minor changes such as micro mutations. And of course, one biologist you didn't mention, I've mentioned him before, who argues this is Rupert Sheldrake at uh, Cambridge University in England, who argues that there are morphic fields that govern all living things. But there's even the possibility that beyond such morphic fields, there are more general formative fields that operate in the universe as a whole. And I think this is what we're talking about when we talk about intelligent design. And uh, for instance, uh, let's turn from living things to non-living things. Let's talk about uh, cosmology for a minute. You start presumably, so it's argued, after the Big Bang with a quantum soup. And over billions of years, this coalesces into cluster, super clusters of galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies, galaxies that contain 100, uh, in our case, Milky Way, probably 100 million solar uh, stars. And some of which are in the center, some of which are in yeah. arms, some of which are And the most arms. recent data from uh, uh, Kepler, which is now shut down, suggests that uh, there may be as many as 300 million planets, I mean 300 billion planets in our own uh, Milky Way galaxy, and possibly 100 billion galaxies in our own observable universe. 
And uh, these individual solar systems, such as our own, they're developed, have so much information in them now from that original quantum soup that, uh, for instance, you have things like Kepler's third law, that uh, when you look at a solar system such as ours, the planets in it are so interacting with the sun and with one another that uh, using the inverse law of gravitation and Newton's laws, you get a situation where the square of the orbital time of each planet is proportionally or constantly related to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. Or when you go down to the quantum level, you have Planck's constant, which says that the uh, energy of a wave function is always constant in relation to its frequency and that you can express this as accurately as six times, six and a half times 10 to the minus 27 Planck's constant. Now that's a tremendous acquisition of information in non-living systems. So I think we're, we can reasonably assume that there is some kind of creative force at work, call it intelligent design, call it God, uh, that works constantly, not just once in the past, but is constantly working and producing differentiation and increasing levels of complexity. And in this sense, living creatures would not be the only source of generating novelty, they'd be just the opposite. They'd be a limiting factor on this force that operates only through the medium of genes and proteins. But the, but the force itself that leads to complexity and higher levels of integration is working everywhere all the time in the non-living as well as Well, I think that uh, it's true that the uh, that the universe has a structure that's that uh, makes one wonder as to whether it's completely unguided or not, and, and rather suspect it isn't. And I think that's an important uh, that's an important complement to what's being said here. It looks like the origin of life required. Uh, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of intelligent design. It looks like now the Cambrian explosion required, if not intelligent design, certainly some kind of organization that's beyond standard Darwinian theory. Um, whether it requires intelligent design or, or <coughs> strongly suggest intelligent design is the subject of the next part of the book. Um, and then it looks like the structure of the universe itself requires some kind of intelligent design as well. Uh, raising the question of, you know, are these different intelligent designers is the same one. Uh, and I, I think that's where, you know, the next phase really needs to go. Once you assume that signature in the cell is correct, and then once you assume that Darwin's doubt is correct, and then perhaps once you assume that pr privileged <coughs> planet is correct, where do you go on from there in terms of uh, what kind of what kind of what kind of attributes can you attribute to this designer that might be helpful for us to understand? or perhaps in some cases to these designers. I'm reminded of a lovely poem or prose by William Blake, <coughs> who was a mystic, and very, very lovely, and I think it's quite apropos, to see the world in a grain of sand heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So we're told, I know what E.G. White said, But if you think about those words, and then a little flower in the cranied wall, why don't you? Got that? 
the little flower in the Queen. Well, that's Wordsworth. He says practically the same thing you probably mm -hmm. recall. Little flower in the craned wall, I pluck you out of the crannies. I hold you in my hand, root and all. And if I could but understand what you are, root and all, and all in all, I would know what is both God and man. The idea that the whole universe is so integrated and differentiated and nested <coughs> hierarchically that any one thing, it's like a hologram, in some sense contains the whole, yeah. and the whole in turn determines the character. And this is not simplistic. We were created, everything about us, our brain, the universe. This, we're getting <coughs> down the semantics. Let's forget. I want to get into something about, in terms of what's going to happen when all of this is revealed, and I'm talking about, nobody ever said anything about Matthew 24. This is, I'm not digressing or anything like that. But the parousia, coming back. What's going to say? We'll be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. And so we're sitting here. He's given us this brain. We don't have to be bogged down in 19th century Wesleyan we're moving on. It's going forward. It's a, it's a work in progress. And this is what the maker wants. And if someone gets insecure about it, let's get unseated and move on. <coughs> so <coughs> I don't want to get prosaic about it. But. Anybody here? Mm. I would, I, would uh, I, I, I heard it. And I would say, uh, reminds me of a discussion we were having uh, back at Andrews University. And the uh, discussion went off into all kinds of these uh, ethereal ideas, and you're going to multiply them uh, ad infinitum of different possibilities and so on. But uh, the fact is that after you've done all this, uh, you cannot ignore the fact that the Bible exists. You cannot ignore the fact that the Bible is by far the most popular book uh, ever published. Uh, you cannot ignore the fact that it has some remarkable predictions in it, uh, historical predictions. Uh, you cannot ignore the fact that it gives us meaning to life uh, and so on. So uh, let's keep that in the circle. We will do that. I, I think that it's probably fair to say that Meyer has, I think, effectively demonstrated that neo-Darwinism really does not have answers for the Cambrian explosion. And there's no particular reason to suspect that it should because it really doesn't do very well with explaining how you get massive amounts of information all at once. Neo-Darwinism is an, in, an incremental process. And if you need to get from one peak to another peak and there's a valley in between, there's no way you can walk across unless you go down into the valley, in which case you're liable to extinction. And so intelligent design can, and we'll see if there are other processes, that's one of the things we'll be talking about, but intelligent design can say, I want to go over there, let's change this, 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 and this, and then we'll be over there. Uh, Neo-Darwinism being blind and only being able to feel one little mutation at a time really can't get there. We can add uh, that, uh, you know, there's carbon-14 dating, uh, residual carbon-14 dating, and there are paraconformities, and they're extremely widespread uh, uh, formations out there that fit so much better with the biblical well, story than age. it does if otherwise uh, we're not without good data uh, we don't have all the answers but you can make an intelligent uh, decision 
that fits well with the biblical model of origins. Well, I think that that's one of the things that will come into the discussion when we start talking about how do you put all this kind of thing together. And uh, we, uh, it depends on how much material we need to go through, but uh, we, may, uh, we may take more than one week on that. This is wonderful church that we're having, and I've got to get over to the sanctuary. <laughs> and I really agree with the brother here. Anything and everything that we're to know is in that book in the Bible. But did we ever stop to think that there are so many things that are there that we don't, didn't understand until the space age, until now. And anything, it's a matter of interpretation, and we don't want to go, as he said, ad and uh, and ad nausea here and talk about all the different interpretations. Uh, 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 we'll have that chance later. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. We will. Have a blessed Sabbath. We're enjoying so much.